Hi, Diefesters. My name is Rudinov Vincent, and I am the founder and CEO of Diefest, where diversity meets inclusion at work. Diefest democratizes content-rich experiences, knowledge sharing, and best practices presented by DEI, HR, and business leaders from a wide range of industries who are making the business case in diversity, equity, and inclusion. In order to drive growth and provide leaders like you with opportunities, we present actionable insights that may help you with the challenges you face today and lead in creating the organization of the future. We believe this is what modern organizations need to look like. So let's jump right into it. Our guest for today is one of the most passionate storytellers and reputation builders I have met. Alex Malouf, Corporate Communications and Global Marketing Director, MEA, Snyder Electric. Named as the first communications innovator in the MEA region, by the Holmes Report and a rising star and future chief communications and marketing officer by Provoke Media, Alex is the only communications corporate chartered communicator, chartered marketeer, and senior communications management professional in the Middle East, Africa, and Iran, who is passionate about transforming marketing, media, and communications and leading the industry through his work and his volunteering. A journalist by training, with a rich cultural mix of European and Arabic, Alex's expertise spans communications and media, public relations, and marketing for both multinational in the energy sector, technology, and FMCG space, as well as several Gulf based government institutions. Alex has spent the last 20 years in media, marketing, public relations, and sustainability on the client and the agency side. His aim is to use marketing and communications to further organizational reputation and operations. His focus areas include aligning marketing and communications to the business developing creative and unique concepts that work in this region and making Marcoms as measurable as possible. He has managed a large portfolio of clients, both national and multinationals, through each and every phase of his corporate development, including public offerings, product or company launches, internal communications and corporate affairs, crisis communications, and ongoing corporate positioning. Alex has a passion for working in emerging markets, and his expertise lies in focusing on the gaps between local organizations and global units to ensure that expectations are surpassed and that local staff have the skills and the experience to develop their country's unit on their own initiative. Alex, thank you so much for being a part of DieFest, and warm welcome on board. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'll start off by asking a very simple question to you, Alex. I mean, out of your expertise, how does sustainability relate to diversity and inclusion? Both are fundamental to good businesses or, or well-run organizations, not just any businesses. It could be anything which is government or not-for-profit. Um, both contribute significantly to uh, culture within the organization. But also both are often hard to understand or are misunderstood. Got it. So I would count those three common threads between the two subjects. Okay. So uh, for our listeners, Alex, you know, most of them belong to the human resources and the diversity space. How do you see DEI and sustainability leaders together? working in order to create a strong employer branding? And I mentioned those three common strains. Yes. There's a fourth strain in, in many respects, which is how the younger generation, um, millennials and, and younger, um, I'm a millennial just about, so <laughs> um, I count myself, you know, on some days, but I, I think for me, it's what those groups or how those groups view those two subjects. They are very passionate about sustainability. Look at the research that Nielsen and others have done. For example, Nielsen says that with the millennials, um, you are looking at 75% who make decisions with sustainability in mind. So very much focused on on the environment, but sustainability isn't just something in the environment. You know, if you look at sustainability, look at the sustainable development goals, you have 17 goals of which um, equality uh, features prominently. You know, gender oh, yes. equality, um, you have 
the notion of justice, um, and you can include, you know, obviously the issue of, of human rights, but also then you've got issues around environmental justice and other concepts. And then if you look at uh, Generation Z um, as well, um, they are even more passionate about these subjects. You know, if you think, for example, of all of the, the environmental campaigners, <clears throat> you know, they're, they're the most famous ones uh, are effectively today, they're all teenagers. You know, you think of Greta and you think of others um, who are passionately advocating for environmental justice. So you've, you've got this group and they're also a group which cares about issues which are related to sustainability, as I said, the SDGs, and, and D, E, and I features there prominently. Um, you know, they, they do notice, uh, for example, when they walk to a room, uh, the issue of, of the gender ratio. They do notice when there are, um, when, when there is a good balance between cultures, between ethnicities. They also notice when there is an imbalance as well. And, they may not vocally say something about this, but sure. it does register with them. Um, and I think they are more minded and more aware of asking questions um, about a culture than possibly people who are older than them. Um, well, and yes. you see this within young industries as well. For example, you look at the tech sector, the tech sector, uh, look at the big Silicon Valley firms and others in the US, um, this is where you've seen, for example, walkouts on issues around gender inequality um, and, and other issues related to, for example, um, ethnicity and balance in the workforce. Um, you know, if you look, for example, at representation, representation for minorities. So, you know, th there is that linkage um, of these, this younger group or these younger groups where they want to see more fairness, uh, more equality. Yes. And also as well, they, they want to see organizations addressing these issues. So there was very much a time when organizations um, to, you know, to sort of look at Friedman, it was all about profit and it was about shareholders. Yes. Absolutely. Now that is not the case anymore. It is about, okay, you, you obviously have to ensure that you are making a profit, so in order to be sustainable, to keep operating, but what are you doing beyond that? What are you doing, for example, in terms of net zero? What are you doing in terms of issues on um, um, judicial, not sorry, judicial fairness, on, on racial justice? Um, and we've seen this, for example, in terms of Me Too, uh, we've seen it in terms of other movements, um, in the US, uh, particularly in 2020, um, oh, yes. around race. Um, and we are, we are seeing this sort of slowly gather and slowly happen in other markets. And even, for example, what we've seen only a couple of weeks ago in terms of China and one of their Olympic tennis stars. So it yes, is slowly spreading um, and it's slowly becoming, surely becoming an issue I think which which many companies um, in many different countries need to address, and even if I look at it in the Middle East, I, I even I do feel it's going to happen here. The, the civil society here is different, but uh, it's inevitable. You know, if it's being raised outside, it will be asked about on the inside as well. I think the beauty about this uh, generation is the fact that uh, they are vocal. They are vocal. They advocate for rights. They talk about it. And they expect companies to follow it. I think with the with the whole future generation, you know, being millennials, I mean, there's a lot at stake for companies if they don't follow, you know, sustainable practices. And we're talking about a generation that's racially the most diverse generation today. I think I think they have no choice. They have no choice. The yes, absolutely. Well said. Um, <laughs> you know, unless we take action now, we're pretty much screwed um, in terms of. Uh, climate warming, you know, keeping under two 1.5 degrees Celsius, even that's going to be a stretch. Um, if you look also at the issue of race, um, you know, race has always been an issue everywhere, um, but it's now being finally discussed. It's not always been discussed healthily, 
um, there's still a lot of controversy around race. You know, for, for me, honestly, some of these things are basic facts, but you know, there, there are there are the politics around these issues. Yes. Um, <clears throat> but employees are, are asking. They are, they are saying, you know, are we behaving the right way possible um, for our all of our stakeholders, not even just our shareholders, are we behaving the right way possible, for example, for our suppliers? You know, are the people working in factories in our suppliers, are they being paid a fair living wage? Uh, for example, are we helping our customers when it comes to concepts like recycling? Are we making it easier for them to do the right thing? Um, are we being ethical when it comes to issues around, say, artificial intelligence? And a lot of this is actually is a discussion around the ENI, because the way your organization is set up mirrors how you engage. So, for example, if you've got, you know, I used to work at a very big FMCG, and they always used to say we want to mirror the outside world, we want to mirror our customer base. Um, and the reason was it was pretty simple because we want to think the same way they do. We want to be as representative as they are. Um, and if we do that, then we are gonna be more agile. We're gonna be more responsive to what they want and what they need. And every, every customer is different. Every group is different. There you go. Thank you very much. There, there's my D and I. Go for it. <laughs> um, I, I think, you know, with all of these things, um, companies need to be really mindful um, in terms of you know, ensuring that everybody is given a fair opportunity, um, that they are representative, and also as well, they're trying to address um, imbalances um, either in the company or in the industry or in wider society. For example, you know, if you work in technology or engineering, uh, the majority or vast majority of people in management are still male. Um, they're yeah. often white. white um, so that's again, you know, how do you address this? How do you make things better so that you you fix these systemic issues, which which make the company a better place to to work at, often make the company better performing, uh, and also as well make the industry more progressive. Absolutely. I mean, this is so well said. In fact. Uh, uh, what role does marketing communications play out here? I mean, how are companies really, or rather, what are companies doing to uh, to win stakeholder confidence? Because now we're talking about uh, we're talking about a phase, you know, within the corporate world, within society, where uh, there's a demand, a huge demand for over transparency. Companies have to be as transparent as they can actually be, and you expect them to be. Uh, it's again uh, the typical phrase of you know profit with a purpose. So what are, those, uh, what are those steps that companies are really taking to win stakeholder confidence, especially when it comes to leveraging you know, a very racially diverse workforce like millennials, for example? So I think the, the first place I always say to any communicator in terms of engaging on and any big issue is start with your employees. Your employees are your most important stakeholder group. They're the people who define the culture, they're the people who get things done, um, and they're also the people who can have the most effect on any organization. So, for example, you know, when it comes to my industry in terms of engineering, you know, we, we have a big focus on, on representing women in the company. What are we doing in terms of telling stories about the women who work for us? Um, it doesn't need to be too complex. You know, it can be, I often say, the shorter the better, especially in terms of video. Um, and again, you know, we have this huge preference for video um, right now, I think partly driven by, by social media. But again, visual, audio, telling their stories, uh, making sure that you know, they are um, out there, they're front and center, uh, both people who are um, extroverted, but also as well as people who are introverted, helping them tell their stories as well. So making sure that everybody's included. You've got other groups as well. You know, you've got people who um, are, as we call it here, which is a nice name for it, people of determination, um, oh, who come into the workforce, um, you know, who, again, want to work, they want to be given opportunities to work, and we want to explain to our wider workforce how we can make this happen. And the success, once we do that, uh, we want to break down those, those biases and those stereotypes. It's also, as well, engaging people in conversations 
within you know within the the, the company um, making sure that that people feel as if they do have a voice and they can contribute uh, and then looking outside so sharing those stories externally um, and also as well opening yourself up to having conversations conversations aren't always easy um, I worked in engineering companies um, over a decade ago where we didn't have I was in Saudi we didn't have any women working for us oh, um, yes. but but sometimes you, you need you know you need you need people to say what's going on and you need people to externally and also instantly to push for change so that that's what it's all about you know, having those conversations uh, being more transparent you know for example on issues big issues as well like pay um, like uh, career development career advancement um, where people are and this is the thing people are talking anyway but it's giving structure to the conversation uh, and it's being open in terms of receiving feedback and the end result is um, not only more transparency but also as well ideally more trust when people see that you are listening to them and you're taking action on what they're saying absolutely absolutely and i think uh, uh, c suites are taking it more seriously right now i think there was a price waterhouse coopers uh, report that said that 96 percent of uh, ceos are now making diversity their personal priority their personal strategy for companies which i think is is, is a big move especially in the last you know 18 to 20 months that the way things have really changed with all the different movements like you said at the start you know, I mean, uh, it's a wake up call. I mean, it's not that things did not exist, but then it called for someone to be vocal about it and to advocate about this. Uh, so uh, how can uh, DEI and ESG leaders actually create uh, the ready workforce, the workforce of the future? How could they work together? There's a natural synergy because sustainability is, it encompasses in many ways D and I. Especially the S. We're talking the, about uh, yeah. accepting the S of the SG. Very, very, very much so. But also as well, governance, you know, the sustainability leaders um, are people who are transparent in terms of what their vision is and also as well what they're doing and reporting back on that, that constantly. Um, where I am now, right now, uh, one of the um, one of the actions that I do like is the fact that in addition to their quarterly reporting, the company is listed, publicly listed, in addition to their financial reporting, they also push out every quarter a sustainability report. So what progress are they making? Where are they making it? And what else are they looking to do? So that, that transparency is, is a big one. Um, I think also the similarity between the two is the need to constantly um, explain and try and, and break down uh, misperceptions about uh, what DNI is there to do, and I think partly because of the politics, there is a lot of misperception uh, in certain countries about DNI. Uh, I also think, as well, it's good to try and break down um, in other countries. You know, for example, where I am, there's a lot of positive talk about DNI, but we don't often sort of open up the the closet and and you know address the the obvious issues obvious um, yes not, I agree not everything you. is positive you know we've got to talk about the hard subjects as well um so i think you know that that's also another issue you know, breaking down uh, the conversation explaining what the issue is um, about and and what the benefits are and then i think once you've done that alongside the transparency you also have the third piece which is all about the engagement um, engaging people uh, making sure that they feel as if they are heard, that they can contribute, and that you value their opinion and their feedback. And you, you want them to be uh, part of the solution in terms of pushing for a more diverse, um, inclusive, and equitable organization. Absolutely. I mean, so well said, Alex. Uh, I was reading a little bit about you and I happened to see that, you know, you've been involved in a lot of voluntary work. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, I don't know where I find the time, I'll be honest with you, but uh, <laughs> I, you know, I've, I've, I've been volunteering for a long time and I, I believe volunteering, you know, even if you, you've got to make the time for it, you've got to find the time for it. Um, you know, you, you benefit from volunteering. I benefit from volunteering in terms of 
uh, the different perspectives I see. Um, first of all, getting out of my routine, getting out of the workplace, um, getting out of the office. Um, obviously, where you know I've been working for virtually for a while, but but still getting out of that mindset, um, speaking with other people, um, seeing what happens is happening with them. Um, Big thing is, is you know, understanding how fortunate many of us are in terms of our position and not taking that for granted. Uh, but also as well, seeing how we as organizations can have a positive impact um, on, on the groups around us, on communities around us. And it also filters into DNI because often, you know, we volunteer with groups um, who we don't mix with in the workplace. Yes. Um, and that's something that we need to address because these groups need to be, every, you know, if you're a large company, you need to be representative of your wider community um, in terms of gender, in terms of race, in terms of ethnicity, in terms of religion. And I think, you know, volunteering gets people, especially people who are sort of often mid to high level, to see something slightly different um, or often actually see something which is very different um, and gets them to think in a different way, gets them to realize that you know, often, you know, in, in corporations, we, we do sort of tend to remain fixed on our, on our four walls, but getting us outside of that space and, and seeing what's around us and, and also realizing as well what we can do, the difference we can make, and trying to bring, again, these communities um, to be part of conversations, but, but also as well, hire from them. Um, you know, it could be, for example, people determination. It could be other groups who are not fairly represented. You know, that, that's the start of a journey in terms of winning uh, people in the organization over in terms of how the organization should be rather than is in terms of its structure, in terms of employment, in terms of its makeup. I think uh, voluntary work is one of the best ways, uh, you know, one can actually grow. I mean, a lot of people don't acknowledge what you've really said. I mean, the fact that you admit you've grown, you know, out of doing a lot of voluntary work. I mean, you, you don't get paid for the kind of work you do, but then uh, you get paid indirectly, which is in kind, and that the value in kind that it comes to you is basically the growth. And like you said, you know, there are opportunities to hire people that you don't otherwise would notice when it comes to uh, following company protocols or following the, the regular hiring system processes. And I think this is amazing, Alex. I, I really want to thank you for, uh, you know, being a part of this, uh, uh, this series. And this has been such a valuable conversation, Alex. And I, I really encourage all our listeners to follow you uh, to to connect with you, uh, I'll be providing your your coordinates uh, to all our listeners. It's been an absolute pleasure, Rudolf. Thank you very much for the intro, and all the best for the forthcoming episodes. Pleasure's all mine, Alex. Thank you. To conclude, Alex's very insightful session. There's a natural synergy between diversity and sustainability, as Alex rightly pointed out. Both relate to the organizational culture and are often hard to understand. Millennials and Gen Zs, who are today the most racially diverse people on the planet, are very passionate about sustainability. They are more inclined towards asking questions about culture, social justice, and environmental issues. Organizations today have moved the needle beyond profit and shareholders to meeting the sustainability development goals such as net zero, racial justice, ethics, gender equality, all being fundamental areas of practice. Even today in many industries, the vast majority of the workforce is still male. There's a need to fix systemic issues to make the company a better place to work and industries more progressive. Your employees define the culture as they have the most effect on the organization. Therefore, engage with them on any big issue. They are your biggest stakeholder, so make them feel that they are a part of a solution. And finally, there are a number of benefits serving as a volunteer on a non-profit board. Do allocate some time for it. Die Festers, we invite you to connect with us if you have any specific challenges or concerns that you would like us to discuss as a part of our series. There's so much to learn and do. Whether you want to join the conversation or sit back and take it all in, remember to subscribe to our podcast, Die Fest Global, to hear from DEI, HR, and business leaders about their successes and challenges on their journey 
to creating an environment where employees feel a genuine sense of inclusion and belonging. You may also like to visit our website, divefestglobal.com, to find webinars where we feature your fellow peers and go in depth on what organizational DEI really looks like. So thank you once again for joining us today. Good luck and stay blessed.